Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about PCB materials and look at the two most fundamental properties of the substrate, DK and DF. With low frequency circuits, these two parameters can mostly be ignored, but in high frequency applications, knowing and understanding these parameters is critical. So today I want to not just look at the exact meaning of these, but also analyze some software tools that take advantage of them. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now in just a moment I'll take these two PCBs that I have from today's sponsor, JLC PCB, and try to extract the DF and DK of the test circuits. Both of these are test sample 50 ohm transmission lines, about 30 centimeters in length, and one is built on a standard FR4 board, while the other is a low loss PTFE Teflon board. So they should have substantially different characteristics. But before doing that, it's important to first understand how these parameters affect the design and why we should even care about them. So first things first, let's look at what these two parameters are. The DK stands for dielectric constant with a K, but it's also called the dielectric relative permittivity. So this expresses how much more electrical field the material can hold in reference to a vacuum. The higher the decay value, the more energy that can be stored. In other words, if you wish to build a capacitor or a low impedance power distribution network, a high decay value will allow you to put more capacitance in a smaller area. Now, at the same time, the dielectric constant also impacts the propagation velocity. Higher decay values lead to smaller velocities. This means that a structure of a specific wavelength can be smaller if a higher dielectric constant material is used. Final important consideration to mention about the impact of DK is its relationship to the exact trace geometry when a controlled impedance trace is needed. So when you need to get a transmission line with a very specific impedance, you are directly impacted by the DK since it will decide the specific capacitance that the trace will see. In general, higher DK values will require thinner traces to get the same impedance value. So to summarize all of this in a nutshell, you can say that a design built for a specific board geometry and DK value may not work on a different board construction since the impedances or resonant frequencies will be different. Now, the other important parameter to discuss today is the dissipation factor, also called the loss tangent. This expresses how much energy a material absorbs and dissipates as heat, so a high value means more loss occurs. The material will absorb more of the signal and turn it into heat. Now, in the context of high frequency signals, the dissipation factor will mainly lead to signal attenuation. So signals traveling over long traces on a high DF board will be more attenuated than if the trace would have been shorter or the substrate of a lower DF. Now, another thing to mention here is that the exact attenuation observed is frequency dependent, not just DF dependent. So as frequency increases, a higher attenuation will be observed. Now, in general, the DF of a board is not a big issue below one gigahertz, but once you cross this threshold, it should be taken more seriously into consideration. Now, the theory is nice and all, but how do you apply it? I mean, if I want to build a high speed design, how will the design actually be impacted by these parameters? Well, there are two things to analyze. First, the design's geometry, and secondly, the exact material to be used. So, first tool to look at is today's sponsor JLC PCB's impedance calculator. This tool can be used to calculate the dimensions needed for traces to obtain a specific impedance, either single-ended or differential. And this can be done on the various stackups and various layer counts that they have available. So just as an example, if we leave the default four layers on a 1.6 millimeter thick PCB, and we wish to make a 50 ohm coplanar single-ended trace, and the exact trace to ground distance can be specified either in mils or in millimeters. So right now it's 0.5. So if we hit calculate, we get the exact dimensions that we need for the trace width. Now, if we also want a strip line trace, 
So you can simply add in new impedance to be calculated, still 50 ohms, still coplanar single-ended, but this time the trace is on layer 2, with reference on layer 1 and 3, so now it is a strip line. We can again hit calculate, and the dimensions for both of our traces will be determined. Now, before moving on, it's important to mention that the tool will only allow single-ended impedances between 20 and 90 ohms, so if we request something much larger, we'll get an error appearing. And also, if the requirements cannot be met, so because of the stack up or something, then again, an error will appear. Anyway, coming back to our 50 ohm trace, we can see that with the default stack up, we are getting some pretty thin traces. So 0.13, 0.15 millimeters. However, if we want a thicker trace, so to have less resistive loss, we can go through the various available stack ups and choose one that offers better performance. Final thing to mention is that since the tool allows you to calculate multiple impedances at the same time, so not just two, you can have as many as you want, you can get a nice overview of all of the calculated impedances and the necessary geometries, as well as the final stack up of the board in a single frame. Finally, if you need more information on how to use this tool, there is a dedicated help page linked on the top side. So this explains how the tool can be used, and you can also obtain the decay values for the various materials in use on this other related page. So the one describing the high precision multi-layer PCBs. So if you want to try out any of these stack ups, JLC PCB is one of the best choices. Even multi-layer PCBs are incredibly affordable. Six layer PCBs start at only $35 and you can also get a $30 coupon for your six layer PCBs on their website taking the total to only $5. Sign up today using the link in the description. Now, there are other tools both online and offline available to calculate the trace geometry when a controlled impedance design is needed. However, for the impact of the dissipation factor, calculation tools are far more scarce. However, I did find one. So one of the major players in the electronic simulation field is Cadence. And one of the free tools that they offer is the TX line calculator. So you can get this once you fill in the requested form. Now, once you turn it on, you can see that it's quite a simple interface where you can select between multiple transmission line geometries, after which you need to select the dielectric that you're using with its parameters. So there is a list of available materials, but if you don't find the specific thing that you need, you can simply fill in the data by hand. So the typical values for something like FR4 are a dielectric constant of 4.6 and a loss tangent of about 0.015. From here, you can either fill in the electrical characteristics that you want or the physical characteristics of the structure that you have. And by using the arrow keys, you can go from one set to the other. So if you filled in the electrical characteristics going right, will give certain physical lengths and widths based on the height and thickness that was provided. And if you select, let's say a different width and you then go to the left, this will calculate the electrical parameters of this geometry. Regardless, one of the most interesting things here is that based on the specific frequency that was provided, you also get a specific loss value, which can be expressed in multiple units of measure based on what you actually need. Now, it's important to observe that this tool doesn't just calculate the dielectric loss, so based on the loss tangent, but also the conductor loss, based on the exact conductivity of the material. And to prove this, we can first of all set a loss tangent of zero, so this would be an ideal dielectric, and if we recalculate, we can observe that we still have a certain loss appearing. And on the other hand, we can specify a realistic loss tangent, but specify a unrealistic conductivity. So 5.88 times 10 to the power of 66. And if we recalculate again, we still get a specific loss value. So by doing these extreme cases, you can observe for your specific geometry how much of the loss is dielectric related and how much is conductor related. And well, using realistic values for both, you should get the sum of the two losses. Now, another important observation is that your circuit 
at 10 gigahertz will have a lot of loss. But if your frequency of operation is much lower, say 100 megahertz, then the loss becomes almost insignificant. So knowing the exact losses that you are getting in your realistic application will be important to better choose the dielectric that you need and the exact conductor and its thickness. Knowing how to design a board that takes into consideration the PCB properties is one thing. But how do you check the actual results? So when you're building a board with controlled impedance traces, like this one, so you have your RAM memory interface and you have some differential traces, you want to make sure that the results are as expected, so that the traces have the correct impedances. But measuring the traces to confirm the behavior when everything else is already assembled is not really possible. So one technique that you can use is to add a test trace either directly on the board or onto an unused area or somewhere on the panel. So for example, the test board for today is part of a larger panel that contains another circuit as well. And I can measure the test board and conclude that the circuit is also built with the same substrate since it's from the same batch. This is just a two PCB panel, but you could have 100 useful boards and just one test trace, and the principle would be the same. So once you do add in the test traces, what do you do with them? Well, you could apply TDR, time domain reflectometry, to measure the impedance throughout the trees, but another method that I found was to measure the S parameter matrix and extract data from that. So I found this really nice article on the Microwaves 101 website with its associated spreadsheet, and I highly recommend that you go through the article first to properly understand what the spreadsheet is actually supposed to do. So they go into quite a lot of details here explaining how it works and what it will give you. But in a nutshell, once you fill in a set of S parameter measurements and clearly define the test trace properties, you should get among other things, the DK value and the DF values. But these will only be correct if the measurement was also done correctly. Now I measured the test boards using the light VNA to get the S11 and S21 parameters, and then flip the boards around and remeasured to get the other two parameters, the S12 and the S22 values. Now, these should be the same, but the tool does request them to get a better averaged out result. So to account for any imperfections and measurement errors. And while coming back to my test board, I did something that is not really recommended. So a good test trace usually is a straight, uniform as possible line. This really isn't. I made it this way to be easier to measure at lower frequencies, but the downside is that it's not so uniform anymore. Now, when looking at the results, the first thing to highlight is the gain or well, the attenuation. So what I have here is the S21 gain plotted out for the two test traces. And I performed the measurement from 10 megahertz up to six gigahertz. And the graph has quite a significant ripple in it. So the trace isn't really a uniform 50 ohm line. However, we can still confirm the expected behavior. The exact amount of attenuation is first of all frequency dependent. The higher the frequency, the more substantial the attenuation is. And we can also see a clear difference between the FR4 measurement and the PTFE measurement. So the two PCB substrates are giving a clearly different result. Now, I also did in a thread line to highlight the exact behavior that's being observed. And if we take as reference an attenuation of minus two decibels, the 30 centimeter long FR4 trace is achieving this point at around 1.7 gigahertz, whereas the PTFE only reaches this close to five gigahertz. So clearly the attenuation is much more significant on the FR4. However, if we also try to use the Excel file, first of all, there's a README tab with instructions that you should analyze in a bit more detail before starting to use this. But long story short, you need to fill in the data for the long sample tab and the short sample tab with S parameters. So here you need a complete S parameter matrix. So S11, S21, 
S12 and S22. Then you need to go to the calculation sheet where you need to enter the length of the test trace as well as a fill factor. And finally, for the loss model, you have a set of parameters that need to be defined so that the model best averages out the measured data. So once all this is done, the results can be analyzed. So starting with the FR board, we can first go to the DK and KF tab. So here for the DK, we are expecting a value of around 4.6 and the result, this DK smooth, at least in the region where the measurement is stable, does confirm this value. So we're very close to the expected 4.6. And while the DF or the loss tangent can be observed on this 10D chart. So if I just remove this second graph and you are left with the method one calculation, we can see that the loss tangent is reported somewhere in the 0.13 area, which is a bit better than it should be. So for this specific FR4 board, the loss tangent should be around 0.015. If we now move to the PTFE board, again starting with the DK, the tool is calculating a value of around 3, so very close to the real 2.9. Again, this value is kept in the initial frequency area before the measurement becomes unstable. And for the loss tangent, again, if we remove the second trace, we can see that we are getting a slightly higher value than expected, somewhere in the 0.003 range, which is higher than the PTFE should be at 0.0016. However, to some extent, the loss has been increased by the presence of the solder mask on top of the trace. So in high frequency designs where loss is critical, the solder mask is usually removed. But anyway, we are getting a far better result than we had for FR4. Now, it is true that both the DK and the DF are not constants. They vary over frequency, temperature, and even humidity, but the measurement should be far more stable than this. So if you need to know the exact properties of a board under specific non-standard conditions, measuring the board using one method or another will be necessary. In the end, understanding and knowing the exact values of the DF and DK of a PCB substrate is critical in making a good design. In the digital world, these values will impact the signal integrity characteristics of communication buses, and with the RF world, these will impact the exact signal attenuations found in various circuits. So taking these into consideration in your design will be mandatory. And with that said, hope you enjoyed this video. And if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.